So welcome everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here with you again. I think I just realized it's been a year since I've been back here because I the remodel kind of threw me off. <laughs> Looks like a totally different place. I feel like we could do full contact sports on here and crystal bathing stuff. So <laughs> feels good, right? <laughs> so I think what we're going to do is sit for about 30 minutes and um, I'm going to guide it partially and then leave some just space for silence in your own practice. But the idea here is uh, I'm going to weave in the themes of tonight, uh, both conceptually, we're going to discuss and talk a little bit, and then also practice based. So for me, it's very important that we get a taste in practice of what we're talking about, because otherwise it just hits the conceptual cognitive mind, which usually gives us like, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it, and then it disappears. It's like taking notes, you know, of something and then a year later, you have no idea what she wrote, right? Because <laughs> it sort of didn't sink in. It just, is some, it just becomes a cognitive approach. And especially talking about the nervous system tonight and how to heal uh, the overwhelm that many of us uh, experience and feel in, in modern society. Uh, this specifically uh, refers to getting into the body and a little less conceptual and getting into communication with the body and what that means and what I call inhabiting the body more and more and learning to do that. So for some of you this might be familiar and you might already have a relationship with inhabiting the body to some level and for some it might be completely new. So we'll kind of hopefully hit all ranges. So feel free to find a posture that feels relaxed yet alert. Just coming into the body, feel free to make any micro adjustments you need. You want to gently roll the shoulders or stretch your neck. And as you do that, just become aware of the body. See if you can feel those micro movements, those stretches. And you're welcome to close your eyes if you'd like. And I also recommend actually opening them. Uh, it's a different experience depending on what you're dealing with tonight. So if you find your getting taken off into your imagination or losing the presence of your body, opening the eyes can really help. It really helps us to stay present. So you can experiment with that a little bit. But for now, we're going to first just do a brief body scan. And this body scan functions for two things, which is to help us come into the body and relax and find a sense of ease. And also to begin this process of attuning to the body, becoming aware of it, both grosser forms of our sensory experience and more subtle forms of it. So I just want to invite you first to bring your attention to the crown of the head. Just connecting with whatever sensations are arising there for you or a lack of sensation. As we begin to move down into the face and head, just connecting with the muscles around the eyes, around the forehead. Noticing whether they're tense or relaxed. Noticing if they're contracted or open. And during this whole process, whether you notice contraction or openness, it's okay either way. You can invite that contraction to gently release, but we're also not applying some judgment that we're somehow bad for being contracted. It's just noticing that being aware of that. As we come into the forehead and eyes, just allowing the muscles to relax, we can begin to gently scan down into the cheeks and jawbone, letting the lips gently part, letting the jaw relax. You may even just start to notice how tense your jaw is. This is where we hold a lot of our aggression from the day or a lot of the tension or doing. So from becoming aware of our face and the front part of our head, we're going to move into the center of our head, into our brain, and simply just inhabit that space for a moment, noticing how it feels to inhabit that space, what's arising for you, and just allowing the head to relax as you do that. So here, relaxation is not something we get or force ourselves into, it's just a perspective of letting be and then relax relaxation comes naturally when we start to let be. 
when we start to show up for ourselves with compassion, with loving kindness and ease. And from the interior space of the head, we can begin to scan towards the back of our head, noticing how that feels as we move through the head, connecting with the base of our skull and moving down into the, down the brain stem into the neck. So we'll stay along the spine mostly, but we'll be connecting with different energy centers of the body as we move down the spine. So here just abiding and inhabiting the space of the throat, noticing how that feels, whether it's constricted or open. What happens if you simply allow the throat to exist in the way it does now and let be with it? Which means meeting it, listening. Not turning away, but also not becoming hijacked by it, just simply being aware. Same as we move into our shoulders, just noticing how we're holding the shoulders, whether there's tension or ease constriction or openness. And as we begin to move along the spine into our heart center, just coming into the space at the center of our chest. Again, just noticing how that feels for you right now, whether it feels alive, connected, tender, or maybe it feels constricted and closed. And here, again, there's no judgment for how that is. We're just simply noticing it and letting be in that experience. Just simply being with, offering some company to that part of our body, all of the parts of ourselves that arise within the heart. This is one of those charged areas, too, where a lot of emotion can arise. It's the center of our carrying warmth, and when it's constricted, it can also become closed off, isolated from ourself and others. Just noticing how that feels for you. And as we begin to move down from the heart center into our midsection, we're beginning to come into the space of our groundedness and power in the body. And here power is a tricky word. It's not a word describing the power we're taking over someone else. It's actually our own rooted innate power within the body, which more expresses as courage, groundedness, ease, so as we move down the midsection, down the spine, just coming to rest at the belly and letting the belly just gently protrude. For those of us trying to get our six packs, which I've been working on for a while, still working on it. <laughs> It's a little funny to push our bellies out, but just feel how that grounds you a little bit when you let it round like a balloon. Just pushing out at the level of the belly button. Just stay there for a moment, let be there. When we're not experiencing groundedness and our innate power, there can be a sense of anxiousness, buzz, like butterflies there as well. Just a slight dis-ease, like not feeling quite settled. And that's okay. See if you can meet that and let be with that. And maybe to remind here is a good thing. Any of the practice we do tonight that's connected to embodied self-awareness, if it's becoming too overwhelming, there's no pushing. It's all very gentle. It's all in a spirit of kindness towards yourself. So you're always welcome to just fully come out of the practice if you're getting too triggered and overwhelmed by any feeling or simply just back off a little bit or go to another place in the body 
where you can resource and feel safe. So just noticing now as you sit in the belly in our center of groundedness, courage, What happens when you start to open there? What happens when you start to lean in? When we begin to inhabit that space of the body? When we begin to meet our anxieties and possible unsettledness with a sense of letting be as opposed to needing to run or push them out? And from here, we're going to begin to move down through our hips into our pelvis and just stay here for a moment. So here in our pelvis is the center of our bliss. It's also a center for our sexual energy that can be constricted and blocked or open and flowing in a healthy way. So for many of us, this is a very tricky and sensitive area, often with trauma on a scale. So just connecting with it briefly, we'll begin to move down through the legs, knees, the front and back of our calves. And finally, just connecting with the feet as you just lovingly and gently wiggle your toes. So for some of us, we can feel into the body easily and we can connect with it. For some of us, we can't. And if you're having a little more trouble, you can move a part of the body, make it active. So I like to move my toes, just sensing the ground below me. It also feels really good, like I'm under the covers in bed. So there's a coziness that we're starting to connect with and develop in the body. And from here, I just want to offer a space where we can begin to connect with the floor and ground below us. So this is going to become one of our resources for the rest of our practice. If we get into trouble in the body or we just need to steep in a loving, kind and nurturing presence. So we start by just feeling what parts of the body are connected to the ground below us. So whether our feet are the only connection point or we're sitting on the ground and we have the connection of our knees, feet, legs, sit bones, just feel your body on the earth. Just allow yourself to connect with that for a moment. And if the mind simply is spinning a narrative and conceptualizing that, just simply allow your attention to drop into the body and feel. Again, you can continue to wiggle, wiggle your toes if that helps. So we're just sensing our skin as it connects with the earth. So from here, we're going to invite in just a very gentle embodied contemplation of the earth as not just a lifeless, cold ground, but a ground that's alive, nurturing, maybe even caring. 
this ground of the earth that we all sit on, or we're all connected by, also supports our bodies. We walk and sit on it. Our bodies are fed and nourished by it. So just allow yourself to come into just a gentle contemplation on the earth as a garden or place that we can resource from, that we could feel grounded on, that we can feel nurtured and cared for by. And you can start with imagery in this or just a gentle contemplation, or you can just simply feel your body arriving on the earth, maybe even being held within it. Just take a moment to connect with that. And also I want to invite you into a space where we can open to this, that we're not alone. The damage of self-isolation culture and hyper-individualism, that it trains us to be so self-reliant that we forget how interdependent we actually are with everything. That actually we can't survive on our own. And there's no weakness in that. There's actually a strength in understanding and experiencing that. And when we try to cut our, we cut ourselves off from that, we experience suffering based on that artificiality, based on that unreality. So part of this process is coming into the body and allowing, and the other part is allowing a sense of tenderness to develop, a sense of openness that we can rely on others. And here, we can rely on the earth as a figure that holds us, as a presence that nurtures us. So we're actually always in relationship with something. And to pretend we're not is a lot of pain. It's a lot of sadness. It's a lot of suffering. So just Invite yourself into a process of relationship. See how that feels. But what's beautiful about connecting with the earth below is it doesn't make any demands on us. It's not a quid pro quo relationship. It's unconditional. So just connect with that for a moment. From here, we're going to invite our awareness to not only inhabit this space of the lower body in connection with the earth, we're going to invite it into the rest of the body, almost as if we're perceiving and attuning to the body as a whole. One way to do this is kind of a reverse body scan, but as we move back up the body, we don't lose connection with the part we just came from. So as we move up the legs, we don't lose connection with the feet. So see if you could play with that for a moment at your own speed. Just coming up the body until you feel the body as a whole and just see if you can rest in that for a moment. So we need a little bit of awareness and presence. So if the mind gets carried away, just bring it back to this felt sense of the body.
So coming into a felt sense of the entire body, just allowing the energies of the body to flow in whatever way they're moving for you right now, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or just a mix of both. There could also be sometimes a neutral feeling, which doesn't feel pleasant or unpleasant. But our main approach here, no matter what's arising, we're approaching with a sense of awareness and kindness, just allowing what's taking place in the body right now to be as it is. And our job is simply to practice meeting that and listening with an open heart. so beautiful when we sit like this with an open heart is we have total permission to not have to do anything. You don't have to be anybody. And an open heart certainly doesn't mean we have to do something loving. Just being is the act of love. Just meeting with a sense of curiosity instead of judgment is an act of love. So this is actually metta, or loving-kindness, embodied. That's what we're practicing. And here, if there's also a particular contraction in the body, something that feels tense, or sore, or tender, or painful. If you feel up for it, you're welcome to simply move there in the body. Just meet that part of yourself like you would meet a friend. A friend who's in need, a friend who's suffering. You can even ask the question to yourself, what is the most compassionate way I could respond to this part of myself? Simply go to it and listen. Notice what helps your body to feel safe and relaxed, and notice what doesn't. When we resist our experience, it actually doesn't help us feel more safe. It usually creates more agitation. So we do need a little bit of courage to meet something that might be a little uncomfortable or a lot uncomfortable. What we soon discover is there's a new way to meet our body. There's a new way to meet the parts of ourselves, the parts of our emotions, energies, sensations, with a sense of compassionate presence. Compassion here in the space of allowing and just meeting without judgment. Presence where it's a space of now, not yesterday, not the future, now. So our nervous system can actually hold memories in the body. Some of these are positive and helpful and some are not, what we would probably call different forms of trauma. And since our nervous system is responsible for a lot of the communication in our body, when the nervous system is in a loop, stuck in the past, that communication is also stuck in the past, and we can't move into the present. 
So by meeting the body in the present, by meeting whatever's arising in the present, we begin to heal and update those memories. We begin to offer space for them to grow and mature. But it doesn't happen through some big magical technique. It happens through just being. Inhabiting the space of the body, waiting, just showing up with a compassionate presence. You can choose how much you want to lean into something. If you feel like leaning in is too overwhelming, just move back to this resource of the earth. Just connect with Again, the earth as a nurturing force, come back to the feet and legs. So we'll just practice this for a few minutes silently. With the same awareness that's been observing, that's been inhabiting the space of the body or connecting with whatever's arising within it. I want to begin to slowly move this into sensing not just our inner world, but the environment around us. So it's always good to bridge the practice so we don't go from one space to a totally different space, but they blend and unify a little bit more. So feeling the whole body once again, just letting the awareness, the resonance of the present moment, attunement just to begin to sense the feeling of the air on your skin, the temperature of the air on your skin. We begin to move out from the inner parts of the body towards the outer parts. Again, we may be noticing how we're holding our muscles in our body at this point. From here, noticing any, noticing any sounds around us or lack of sounds, just simply coming into connection with them with a sense of curiosity and openness, just like we've been providing for our inner world of feeling. (laughs) 
Same with, other, with our other senses of smell and taste. We'll see if we can move into the next one. Every time I say, open your eyes in meditations, people seem to think the meditation is over for some reason. But what we're going to actually do here is gently let our eyes open, but we're not going to look around the room. We're simply just going to look directly in front of us. Just let the body remain still. See if you can sense the entirety of your sensory experience. The body, sound, smell, taste, and sight. Notice we'll stay with that for a few moments as you let your eyes gently open. So please open them now if you haven't already. See if you can continue to sense the body while the eyes are Coming back into the room, we're sensing the space in the room. Just noticing that shift that took place in the last 30 minutes. Just gently letting the body now move in a way that feels nurturing for you. Starting with some micro movements, making them larger from there. I like to sway back and forth. Whatever feels good for you, it's fine. So, um, someone who's n- who's not here, <laughs> I asked him, "What should I do tonight?" And he said, "Oh, maybe do more meditation because normally we don't get to do a lot of. There's just a little bit of meditation." Um, so I thought maybe I'll do that, but he didn't show up. So <laughs> I feel kind of bad because <laughs> you all are here and present. Um, so as you know, the topic tonight, I want to talk a little bit about. How to work with a nervous system, especially a nervous system that tends to be overloaded for a lot of us. Or maybe a lot of us go in between a settled nervous system and, a, and then a nervous system that is overloaded, right? Um, and what that means and what are the mechanisms that are happening within that. Um, and most importantly, how to work with that, how to heal that. I would say heal it in the short term and also the long term. I'm going to talk a little bit... Um, not so much from a scientific, like a Western science base, uh, though I did use the word nervous system here, but I'm going to talk more of the energetic system in the body and how that energetic system connects to the nervous system. So actually my science I'm going to talk about tonight is older than Western science. So this is, a, I call it a 2,600 years of research and development uh, in Buddhism, which often gets discounted by Western arrogance that thinks it knows better than Asian communities or anyone else for that matter. Uh, But actually, this stuff is really old and it was and is down to a science in the sense that we have Ayurvedic, Tibetan, Chinese medicine, other forms of indigenous medicine that really map the body incredibly. Uh, Of course, we have amazing technological breakthroughs that can help prolong life now. And I would say surgery is probably one of the things that, you know, upgraded in in modern society. I think in in India now, there's some really wonderful hospitals that are a blend of modern medicine and ancient Ayurveda. So they'll treat some things with Ayurvedic herbs and Ayurvedic techniques, and some things will just use modern surgery, which is, I think, is a really cool way to blend this stuff. But either way, what I mostly wanted to talk about is the esoteric forms of understanding the body. So in Ayurvedic medicine in Tibetan medicine, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about tonight, though I'm not a Tibetan doctor, I wasn't trained in it, but I'm trained in more the meditative aspects of it, which is understanding what's called the subtle body. Yeah? So the subtle body is something that is formless, and it sits in between the physical body and mind. Right? So this is the one bridge or juncture 
that in Western science and medicine, they just haven't been able to measure this yet empirically. I think at some point they will. They'll come up with some kind of tool or contraption that will be able to measure the subtle body. But for now, the way it's mostly measured is through pulse diagnosis. So some of you who have been to Chinese doctors or Ayurvedic doctors, they train in actually uh, feeling the, what are called the wind energies in the body. So this is one part of the subtle body. And then they can see what's happening. They can see where is the issue? Uh, where is the root of the dilemma you're having in the body? And it's all riding on the winds, which is the, the element of movement in the body. So without going into too much of a description of these, I'm just going to name them and then we'll talk about mostly how to settle uh, disturbances. So the subtle body is, is composed of three elements, uh, at least in the Tibetan and Ayurvedic systems, which are the prana or, or wind energies in the body. It's not just a clothing company. <laughs> it's actually something in our body that's moving. And like I said, wind energy or prana is really about movement. Uh, we couldn't see or hear without it. We couldn't... Uh, you know, do our thing, like in the bathroom without it. It, it. We have all these wind energies moving through us that help the mind to move. When we think, it's also the prana or wind energy moving. When we speak, when we move uh, with the body, it's all prana. And so there's a prana that's embodied in our body within the elements of our body, and then there's also a prana that exists outside of us, like in the actual, in the movement of the wind, in, in earth, in everything that exists, yeah? I mean, people, uh, I think, attribute like a spiritual component to it, but I would say it's a little bit more elemental. It's not really spiritual. It's more like a, just something that is. It's just a deeper part of phenom phenomenon, right? Of the phenomena around us. So this is the wind energy. And what rides the wind energy is what are called uh, the bindu, which is our elements of deeper emotion, uh, whether we're feeling joy or depression, whether we're feeling happy or sad, whether we have like a vibrant, vital, I would say like sexual drive or not. So the bindu is really connected in with this. And for a lot of us these days, the bindu is pretty exhausted and tired and kind of dry and burnt out for many of us, right? And I'll explain why in a second. Now, the bindu rides uh, the wind. So the wind energy is responsible for moving that bindu, which we could call like essential drops or kind of uh, life, life force drops. It's, it's responsible for moving it throughout the body. And where does it move through? It moves through the third element, which is the, the channels, right, of the body. So we see these represented in chakras and things like that. And again, they usually take on a mystical interpretation. But actually, they're just centers of channels winding and becoming twisted and knotted, right? And so we have uh, all human beings, when we're born, uh, we have them knotted in, in spaces in the, in the head center, in the throat, in the heart, uh, here at the, below the navel, and, and at our pelvis, in, 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 our, in the root chakra. So these are just natural knots. But then we have all kinds of other knots that happen due to our experiences, traumas, uh, the way we're raised, the way we grow up. And these all don't have to be bad, necessarily. They just form who we are. So this is kind of the mechanism that interfaces between our thoughts and emotions and our body. And so it's quite profound because also disease and uh, what we call physical illness starts at this level. It starts at this level of subtle body. When this gets thrown off, it throws off the rest of the body. But I'm not going to go into that tonight. Mostly what I'm going to go into is what is our modern predicament, which is a lot of times due to just so much exertion and pushing our bodies hard and overthinking uh, a lot and you know being trained in mostly cognitive thinking through seeing the world like for me for instance the approach I just showed you of, of more embodied self-awareness this was something I only ran into maybe 10 or 12 years ago before that you know for me personally there was no way for me to understand the world but through the thinking mind and what this does is it stirs the wind, wind energy up in ways that weren't intended for the human body. And the wind energy can get really excessive in the chest and head. And when that happens, uh, we experience anxiety. We experience uh, eventually depression because it's like the anxiety forms a loop, an energy loop in the body, and it wears out the adrenal systems and it wears out other parts of the body and everything just crashes into depression, right? Um, in extreme cases, it, it can create psychosis, like people who have psychotic breaks. So this is all responsible when, when the subtle body's off. So that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that we can repair it. We can uh, make it healthy with the way we treat our bodies through our actions, slowing down, 
being more conscious, being more aware, and through certain breathing techniques I'm going to teach you tonight, as well as the practice we just did. When we allow the body to settle and we meet it, actually the body slows down. The energies in the body can have a chance to settle, right? Because it's sort of like this wind energy that we're always stirring up because culturally we have a lot of attachment to excitement, right? Like, I don't know about you, but when I'm sitting there, sometimes for years I just sit there and be like, I got to do something. Like, something's got to happen. Otherwise, there's something wrong, right? And some of you might not experience that, but for me that was... Uh, just a common everyday thing. Like, I gotta do something, I gotta be moving, doing this. So that's usually a sign the wind energy is a little bit uh, disturbed, right? So, what can we do? We can, through the breath, uh, we can manipulate the prana, more or less, to settle, right? So in, in just straight hatha yoga, when we're doing different asanas and we're doing different breathing techniques, there's an effect because we begin to settle the prana, right? But what I would say is when we start to develop more embodied self-awareness, when we are allowing ourselves to just come in and stop resisting what's arising, as well as just acknowledging, hey, I have a feeling body, I have an energy body, it exists, and we start to meet it, we can start to unconstrict the knots that have happened in the energy channels, right? And when those begin to unconstrict, the wind energy can also move smoother. So what's so interesting here, I find, is that what we take as self, like the sense of uh, uh, I am this emotion, you know, whether we're feeling depressed or, or, or happy, whether we're feeling joy or sort of a little low self-esteem, self, low self-worth, we take all this to be who we fundamentally are. But actually what it is, is it's actually just a disturbance in the energy body. So it's actually quite liberating when we start to connect with this in a real way. Because we start to see, just like if we have a cold, I don't know many people when they get a cold, they say, oh, I'm the worst person, I got a cold, <laughs> right? Nobody says that, they're just like, I got a cold. They don't think they're a bad person for it. But when we experience certain emotions, like a lot of anger or aggression, or um, you know, uh, a lot of neediness or something like that, whatever it is, we can name all these different expressions as human beings, we personalize it. And then we become that. And also, other people can, of course, judge us for that and, and you know, say we're this kind of person or that kind of person. But the point here is for us to become free, to understand that our body is actually living and dynamic. And when we start to understand our mind through awareness and we start to affect the energy body, not only can we stop overwhelming the nervous system, because that was the piece I missed out, the nervous system is directly connected to this subtle body. So when the wind energy is spinning, let's say, in the channels of the heart, so I used to have a problem where I had a lot of uh, tension here in my chest. I don't know if other people experience that, like a lot of stuckness and constriction. This means that it's being overwhelmed by the wind energy because basically we're, it's circling in a pattern over and over again there. It's kind of stuck. Uh, but when, when I started to bring it down, this whole space can begin to open up and we can start to feel things we never felt. We can start to feel, of course, a sense of physical openness, but also just our tender emotional heart, things that have been blocked for us for years, like that we can actually be loved and we're lovable and we're worthy. Like those kinds of things sit in the heart. And this may sound really vague and kind of uh, woo-woo to some of you. I assure you, it's really not. I'm just using language, you know, I have no choice. I have to use some kind of language, right? If you want, I can throw in some other words, like, like an F-bomb here and there to make it less woo-woo, but... <laughs> You know, here we're just sort of, you know, I have to use some language to point you to your experience. But your experience actually happens on the level of embodied self-awareness, where you're growing that self-awareness just in the way we just did for about 30 minutes of meaning the body and kind of listening to it, of experiencing, hey, what's arising within it? And not just the outside body, but actually the inside body. And it becomes more and more subtle. So it's like layers of awareness that begin to connect with more and more subtle experiences in the body. Um, this is really my heart practice that I do, and I feel uh, compelled to share it as much with, with as many people as possible because it's been the most transformative for me. So I, I don't know if a lot of you know about my background, but I've been trained in Tibetan Buddhism for the last 20 years, and I spent nine years as a monk. And a lot of people go, wow, nine years as a monk. But I was also like a really disturbed, anxious person during a lot of that time, right? And so you know, people often think of a monk and they have this idealized version of who that person is that you, you know, 
you're somehow on a pedestal. And some people may be the opposite. They think you're an idiot, you know? <laughs> that could be the possibility too if they're kind of very secular minded. But either way, um, you know, I still didn't know how to work with the constrictions and the anxiousness in my body. And for me, this coming in and developing more self-awareness and not just, okay, I did it once I got it. No, every day showing up and every day throughout the day and also going through the shit because we will hit, when we hit anxiety, it's not comfortable. And our mental sort of approach to it or our judging mind has usually been, hey, anxiety, fuck off. Like, I don't want you here. Like, leave. At least that's how I thought of it. And then so we're, we're, we're not only experiencing the anxiety, if that's the case, but we're also resisting it. So there's like a double bind, right? And similarly to any of our other emotional experiences. So I think a lot of this is, I also want to frame it in the idea of how to come into our full humanness with a lot of kindness and love and openness, where we don't have to restrict ourselves to like, oh, I'm either, I'm either sad and not feeling good or I'm happy and therefore feeling happy is better. Not necessarily true, actually. I found actually those moments of spending time with myself in that tenderness of deep anxiety or self-isolation or whatever I was feeling in that moment or, or low self-worth, um, I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about others because it's a way we begin to connect into our human family, right? Because it's not like we are the sole effed up one in our group of friends, right? I find you know, the most sensitive people to, we experience a lot because we're sensitive and we're a little bit more open, so we have to take a little bit more care. I feel like we are kind of the canaries in the coal mine in a sense, right? Because we can, we're sensing, hey, this is, this is, a, this is a culture that's, that's heading towards a precipice, right? I mean, really, in a lot of different ways. But I would say, uh, emotionally and, and uh, subtle body-wise, we're, we're, we're getting pretty close to that precipice because you have uh, just more, you know, things like mass shootings. They're really endemic of a lot of disturbance in this energy body and, and no way to deal with it. Because like I said, for me, I don't know, you, I don't know your experience, so I don't want to judge it, but I wasn't taught another way how to deal with this experience in my body, but to think about it, to cognize it, to frame it in some kind of conceptual thing. You know, when I read a book about it, it's like, good, that's all good, like I can understand that, but how does that help me? How does that put me more in touch with my body and my experience, right? So this is my plea, it's kind of like my propaganda here, like, please get in touch with your body for the sake of our world, actually, for the sake of your children and the people you hang out with, and most of all for yourself, right? And linked in here, I think, is an innate spirituality. And I know some people don't like that word. They want to sort of do secular meditation and secular Buddhism these days or whatever. But what are we talking about? We're talking about some, something spiritual. We're just talking about something unknown. We're talking about a path that leads us out of suffering, however you call that, right? However you refer to that. So instead of this relationship to our bodies and working with anxiety and working with different issues as sort of how can I just get this and be happy, on, you know, happy forever. I don't think we're thinking that conceptually, but a lot of times we're feeling that. We would rather just get rid of all the human experience that sucks and just have this, but that's not possible. We have to meet the suck as well and begin to find resilience within that, right? And so I just call this getting real, just being real with ourselves and others. And it's not a, this part of it I don't like to talk about. It's not a fun thing. It's not necessarily like, pleasant and usually people start checking out like more bodies in the room started moving as soon as they started saying that which shows me you know it's it's tough to talk about this stuff because we want to believe that there's a place we can get within our human life that uh, is like a fairy tale and i do think we can become awakened as a buddhist practitioner what i've been trained in and what i've uh, uh, meditated on and what I've studied, I do feel there is something called awakening. But what that is is very different than what we often think that is. Very, very different, right? It's not, it's very circuitous and strange. <laughs> but at the end of that, we can come into a unified experience of what we actually are. So the spiritual aspect of this practice, what I didn't really intend to talk on tonight, but I'll just say a, a little bit of, and then I'm going to, I want to discuss with you all, is um, when we start to understand these parts of our body, 
uh, the energy body, the, the nervous system, all of this, as well as the wounds within our body, uh, tr relational injury, relational trauma, capital T trauma, whatever's happening. When we start to understand them as, as parts of ourselves that aren't cut off from each other, that aren't distinct and sort of autonomous on their own, we start to experience ourselves as non-compartmentalized, which is actually what we are fundamentally. But the problem is, we experience ourselves as compartmentalized, or what I call sometimes uh, fragmented, right? And what I mean by that is we have all these different personalities, different things going, different parts of ourselves, different emotional reactions, different ways of seeing the world. We don't notice it because we're just glomming onto it and following it. So this is where self-awareness is the biggest tool in our toolbox. When we grow self-awareness, we're able to observe, we're able to find a little bit of space between ourselves and the experience. Not to dissociate, but to notice what's happening. To notice, hey, that was the same emotion as yesterday, but now it feels a little bit different, and I see how it's connected to this thing and that thing. And we start to not only see that process as more unified and, I would say, interdependent, but we also get some space from it. We get some relief. And within that relief, we start to see a bigger feature that we don't have to live compartmentalized, that we also don't have to live in isolation cut off from each other. And there's a lot of pain in that. Like I said during the meditation, there's a lot of suffering in denying what reality is. But the problem is, it's very thick for a lot of us, myself included, that space between what reality is and what we're perceiving. So in Buddhism, we just call this a vidya, which just simply means misperceiving or misknowing something. And a lot of people take this as a negative and then Buddhism gets a bad rap that is just telling me I'm bad all the time. But it's not really. It's just pointing out what the issue is. Just like a skilled doctor would say, hey, you got this thing and we should look at it, right? Same here, it's a misknowing. But what the beauty is here is that misknowing is not who we fundamentally are. And a lot of people miss that in the Buddhist teachings. What we fundamentally are is completely, what we, we would say pure, but what it means is like open, loving, compassionate, but it's a boundless love, it's a boundless compassion. What we fundamentally are is actually free from the constructs of what we think is suffering, what we think is sort of our limited human experience. So the Buddhism says that's the ground we're actually on, but the problem is we're misperceiving that ground to be fucked up, right? Or whatever we're experiencing. So not to get too heady about it, on an embodied level, this just means meeting the body again and again and meeting these parts of ourselves and allowing them to exist. And slowly, slowly we start to heal. And then I personally feel that path of healing is connected into this greater purpose of understanding the self is not a unitary thing that we can find. So again, I have to use kind of philosophical language to describe it. But what it feels like is a less compartmentalized experience. It feels like when people say oneness, it might feel a little bit like that, though that's a weird thing to say. I'm not a big fan of saying oneness because it, it isn't very logically accurate from a Buddhist perspective, but it, the feeling is a little bit like that. We don't feel as cut off from others. Uh, we don't feel as caught in our own internal experience, right? So. Sounds good, right? <laughs> Sign up for $9.99 at only a <laughs> No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit, and then I, I do want to practice a bit more. Um, so just anything from you all, just what, what this is bringing up in you, as well as um, just anything from the practice, too, because I, I did want to, I was going to leave some time after that, but I just kind of launched into some stuff for our cognitive brain. Yeah. Yeah. But also just kind of surprised that I still feel like that. Yeah. So I'm going to teach a breathing technique in, in a moment. So that may help with this because that shortness of breath, it's connected to, um, yeah, a little bit of the, like I said, this wind energy being, uh, I wouldn't say it's like off or messed up. It's more like it gets too abundant in the, excuse me, in the, in the heart and head and throat. And so then it, cr it creates kind of a constriction and a lot of us breathe into the lungs. You know, we do this thoracic breathing up in our chest. 
And I'm gonna just show in a moment just more of a deeper belly breath that can really help with that. Yeah. So I'll answer it in a, in a moment. <laughs> visceral feeling of the wind energy um, circling like resonates with me pretty deeply, but can you speak to why that might show up in the moments that they're least expected, like when we first wake up in the morning or when we're just like having a moment and then it feels very heavy, I guess? Yeah. Maybe you can, a little more uh, detail where Is there a reason that, I guess that's maybe more of my work to be done, I guess, is there reasons that we take note more of um, the spiraling energy when things are calm uh, than when they're fiery or vice versa, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the direct reason is usually it, we have the habit of getting caught up in something once it's more, uh, once it's stronger, right? Mm -hmm. So when an emotion, like when we feel a little bit of annoyed, it's a little bit easier to be aware of that. But when we feel like full blown, you know, pissed, mm -hmm. it's really hard, right? Mm -hmm. Same with craving. Uh, craving, which is one of those things where we wouldn't normally label it as something that disturbs the body, but I'm talking about excessive craving where we just can't stop thinking about something. And a lot of our um, happiness models in the West are built on this craving. So it's hard to notice because we kind of, it, it's exciting and it, it, it kind of wakes us up. And the problem is that uh, we've kind of trained the, the bindu, this part of the subtle body that I said represented um, emotional feeling and things like that. We've trained it to kind of like, like, like when we, what do they call it? Like the, it's connected to the brain element. So when we like tap on something, you get a little dopamine hit. It's connected to that. So these hormones and different things are, of course, uh, connected. Um, but we have to train the bindu more in this kind of sense of mm, being happy for no reason and just feeling a sense of okayness that doesn't need an object to make us feel okay. And that's where meditative awareness really has power. Um, it has power also for creating really healthy relationships because when we don't need so much from someone, we can show up with loving care and warmth for them without this direct sort of fight to, to receive, receive, receive. It can be reciprocal. But um, maybe to answer part of your question too, the wind energy is not so much, um, it's more of the subtle aspect of movement. So we don't quite feel the wind energy. It's pretty hard to feel it. Um, yogi and yoginis can um, once their meditation becomes really subtle. But what we feel is the wind energy kind of uh, disturbing a certain energy center or, or being more uh, prevalent in a certain energy center and then that affecting the nervous system. So it's like here if my, I can guess my wind energy is, yeah, th throat, it gets stuck for a lot of people. Um, I can guess my wind energy is overloaded here because I feel a constriction, you know? It's sort of like, this is the wind energy. This is the, this is the channel. And the sound is the nervous system. So we can like deduce through the sound what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little esoteric, but um, ah, it's just like a model. You know. Anyone else? Anything from the practice itself, too? I'd like to. Well, uh, I don't know if you said this exactly, but I'm kind of drawing a conclusion or one conclusion from what you said that, like, this embodied practice or the body can be sort of the passageway or entryway into sort of seeing that ultimate reality, yeah. as opposed to thinking about it. Yeah. Is that I don't know if you said it that directly, but that's sort of what I took from one of the things you were talking about towards the end. Definitely. Another question. <laughs> yeah, you know, but it's good maybe to clarify it uh, and maybe to clarify what ultimate reality is, you know, what, what we mean by that, which is we mean the, the nature of how things actually are. And this is tricky because from a Buddhist perspective, like I said already, what's happening for most of us is, is more we're stuck in the avidya, which is the misapprehension. So we're not seeing things as they are. Um, so you use the phrase conventional reality for that? Is that one, for, that's one phrase that I've heard for that. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, conventional reality is just anything that, that, we, that we perceive. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe, this is more coming from Buddhist Tantra. So in Buddhist Tantra and Buddhist, uh, what we call Vajrayana Buddhism, there's a, an awakening into ultimate reality that happens through the body. Um, these means I'm using here are not necessarily coming from Buddhist Tantra, 
but I do feel they kind of open the gateways for that to happen. If we then study and you know study Buddhism a little bit more and, and grasp especially what shunyata is, and, and if we kind of meditate on shunyata, then we can blend it with these practices I'm doing. Because for instance, when we let everything be in the body as it is, and we're not touching it, there's a chance to notice its interdependence. And interdependence is a, is a, is a gateway into emptiness or shunyata. So it's powerful. Yeah, so I found this to be so relieving because it's like we can work on both ends. And it's not like concept is bad. It's just that for many of us, this is what I was trying to get at, so maybe I can be a little more direct now. We have no way to view the world but through the conceptual mind. And that's pretty sad because it's cutting off from like 75 to 80% of our, the rest of our experience. So my hypothesis here is as indigenous people, and I would just say, like we're not indigenous now, but at some point our ancestors were indigenous to somewhere, right? So I'm just gonna say indigenous people um, in those cultures and still the ones that exist now who can be classified as actually indigenous, um, I believe they're actually, they're not just seeing the world through the conceptual mind. They have a much more even balance between when to use the thinking kind of logical brain and, and mind and when to just use the body to sense. So what some of you will start to experience if you take this practice on as something, as a heart practice, or you work with a teacher on it, which I recommend, is um, you'll start to be able to sense the world from the body. It's a little scary at first because it seems kind of mystical and you know even people can start to feel other people and things like that. You can enter into conversations uh, with, with, for instance, uh, I was just reading about a therapist who from a young age experienced a sense of feeling what his client was feeling before the client said it. And he, he didn't trust this at first, and then over time he learned to trust it. And this was just a sense of like co-resonance that starts to happen. So um, it can be a little scary because for sensitive people, it can, if we take that in the wrong direction into too much empathy, it can also overwhelm the nervous system. So some of us get overwhelmed because we're too empathic. And so like when you ride the subway super open and empathic, you're going to be fried at the end of the day. <laughs> so we have to meet with teachers and, and people who know how to uh, create good boundaries for, for dealing with that. So I, don't, I went in a different direction, but yes, yeah, ultimate truth in the body. Um, yeah, it's quite beautiful because like I said, it's sort of how I'm describing ultimate truth for the rest of you is this non-fragmented experience. So the misapprehension is that is that the world is fragmented, or that, and the world I mean our perception of the world. Because from a Buddhist perspective, this is not gonna be a popular view, so I'm probably gonna tank on this one, but from a Buddhist perspective, the world is, is there, the question happens of, of, is there a world outside of our perception? And it gets really interesting when you start asking that question. It also gets really scary, because then it's like, well, what about this person? Like, are they responsible for their actions? And what about this? And you know, don't even get me on a political discussion around this. But you see what I'm saying? It, it opens up a lot of questions. Because personally, me, I know for a fact, all I have here is my perception of you all right now in this room and my body and what I'm experiencing. I can't claim anything else, right? I don't know what my point was, but <laughs> just another side note. <laughs> yeah. This is a, a, a question not about uh, uh, plum cushion, but just daily life. Um, I find in, um, something that I get stuck on a lot is, um, and this is especially with uh, regard to uh, nervous system and pain and my, my physical state, which tends to be very volatile. And I, um, you know, can suddenly be feeling quite crappy. Um, is uh, you know. I, you know, I do try to kind of cushion some of the time to not change it, to just kind of sit with it. Yeah. But then, actually, I find more and more that I see little ways, ways in which I can make some little shift, you know, kind of meditate for a minute, you know, take a walk around the block, whatever, something to kind of, you know, change things up. And, 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 and it works quite a bit. And I'm not, you know, it's nice to have those little remedies available. But I often get stuck on something like, this is like the you know, last part of the serenity prayer, or the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, should I, should I just survive <laughs> this habit, or should I try to change it? And then I'll go back and forth, and like, yeah. And, and I wonder if you have any kind of I do advice about that. 
No, I think that's a good question. Um, I'll tell you one of my teacher's advice, which is, I mean, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I think you can work it out for yourself just through trial and error. Yeah. Like I said, um, when I said 2,600 years of research and development, that was 2,600 years of subjective re research and development in, in the men and women of Buddhist lineages, right. just training in their bodies and saying, okay, my teacher told me to work with this, so I'm gonna work with this. They repeated the same thing and then, again, told their students. So it becomes this process of research and development. So I'm a very much of a fan of connecting with a, a teacher who, who does have some uh, uh, exposure to a lineage and has some practice and then experimenting in our own bodies, right? So I would say in, in a way, experiment with yourself, right? In a safe environment with appropriate observation, right? Um, some of them, sorry to go in left field here, but some of the problem with, with that, and that's why I'm saying it with a caveat, is we read stuff in a book or we just go around taking every single class, like Monday night is Kundalini, then it's Buddhist stuff, Tuesday night, then it's some weird whatever the next night, right? <laughs> and our subtle body gets really confused because it's like you're opening doors here and then it, it doesn't know what to do. Same with like uh, uh, psychedelic experiences where it's opening gateways that sometimes we don't know what's gonna happen. Now I'm not saying I'm against any of all that. I'm just saying sometimes we have to be a little bit more selective. Uh, it doesn't mean one's better than the other. So um, to answer your question, one of my teachers, I liked his approach to this because it was like shoot for the, the a little bit more challenging thing first or shoot for the one that's a bit more open, which is the practice we did at the beginning of tonight, just meeting what's in the body and allowing. Right. Then if that doesn't work or the nervous system is still too overwhelmed, apply another remedy. So it's like he's like first you shoot for something more, a little bit more, uh, open and less kind of. Try not to change it, and then if that doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Try, but what I mean by not change it is the practice of bearing witness right. with an open heart right. and feeling in the body what we did it, uh, right. tonight. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then you can do like for instance the breathing practice I'm going to teach before we close tonight, based based on on her question. And then that's very methodical and it's like a mechanical thing, just bringing the wind energy down. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. I kind of alternate. And then sometimes, yeah, we just need a walk. Sometimes we need to, you know, watch Netflix. You know what I'm saying? It's like, be wise and, and smart in that, yeah. That's a good question. Anything else? What else are you guys dealing with in your life around this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but it is sort of um, yeah, it's sort of strange how when well, we're walking and doing stuff, they're having a lot of different body sensations, but you ignore them because you have to catch the D train and go somewhere. But. Yeah, and that's that skillful means. I, I think in Ben's question of of um, yeah, sometimes you, we get more skilled at meditation too, so we can do it. It's meant to be integrated eventually, but we need the strength of meditative awareness to be able to do that. And then you can do it anywhere, walking, sitting, and you know, not just one style of meditation, but different styles. But yeah, sometimes you're just like, fuck it, and you have to run to the train, right? <laughs> that happens too, to me. So um, that's true. And you know, on what you were saying at first, um, it's very real what we experience, but it's not true. And so that's the distinction we, we learn to make along the Buddhist path, because at first, it's, it's pretty normal and natural that we take that not trueness to mean then we kind of throw, throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's sort of like, well, what do they mean by that? Do they mean, you know, all of this is an illusion? And, you know, then sort of we apply the, what, you know, this idea of, of non-duality that bypasses what we're actually need to experience and what's coming up. So I, I'm a big fan of acknowledging something's real. It's happening. Like when we have anxiety and we have to run to that train because we're going to be late, that's real. It's actually happening. But when we 
question into that, it's not true. And so that we get better at. So then what we can do is we can meet that reality with kindness, with love, with an open heart. I'm suggesting with kind of these more embodied self-awareness practices. And, and we slowly learn how to balance something being both real, meaning we're perceiving it, we're seeing it, and that it doesn't have a truth. And that's what we call the unification of appearance and emptiness in Buddhism. But it's a, you know, as you can see, it's a very big concept, it's lofty words. But what it really means is like this way we can dance in our life. See, a lot of us, myself included, because I'm just still on the path, just working, obviously, we don't know how to dance, you know? We go one way or the other. It's either nothing or something. <laughs> it's either all in or all out. And for a yogi or yogini who's skilled at, these, at Buddhist practice, they know how to dance. They really know how to enjoy life. So it's very different than the idea of Buddhism being stuck up and stuffy and kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, emotionless and stuff like that. The more realized teachers I've met, they're completely off the hook, like as in, in people, like very powerful people to be around because they're completely free. So their emotional experience can be expressed without a self. Or I should say without a uh, uh, sort of, without constricting into that self. And so where does it go? It goes into relationship, into how we interact with others in the world. It's very beautiful to watch. I mean, if you just watch the Dalai Lama, like even through videos and stuff like that, that's not fake, like that's really who he is. But also, you know, he may get stern sometimes. There's a, there's a saying, you know, we were joking, friend and I saying, the Dalai Lama, he's not always smiling actually. You know, so there's a little bit of a, again, like a, a pop belief around these kinds of things that when you're awake, you should always be smiling and happy and all that stuff. No, that's all like, it's, uh, what do you call it? Marketing. <laughs> <laughs> but the Dalai Lama is like a living, breathing, he's in a human body. So he's, he's showing the range of human emotions. You know, when he thinks about uh, uh, people who suffer, he cries. When he thinks about injustice, he, he gets you know, he shows anger, you know, he, he shows sternness. I wouldn't call it anger, but I would say like compassionate uh, concern, you know, stern. And so there's, there's room for all that. But it's like that dance, you know. I don't think he also takes himself so seriously. I don't know if that's... So let's practice a little bit, yeah? So I think what we'll do is this breathing practice. So just on Ben's question and your question, I think um, it's good to have different techniques for dealing with an overactive nervous system, for dealing with anxiety and, and, and just a lot of our states these days. So like I said, if you want to come into the body and just do this first practice we did of doing a scan and just connecting with the body, that's wonderful. And for me personally, that works now. Um, when I do that, the body settles. I feel connected with others, I feel connected with myself. But about five or six, seven, eight years ago, I don't think that would have worked enough. And so what I did is a lot of this breathing practice I'm gonna teach you, which is basically what we're doing is we're bringing the excessive wind energy that's not settled, that's sort of up in the throat, chest, and head, we're gonna ask it and welcome it to come down. <laughs> so the home of the lung, or the wind energy, lung is the Tibetan word for it, it's mostly around the large intestine. So uh, we are gonna bring it below the navel, right? And so this is more of a healing technique for asking or providing an awareness where the wind energy can ride the breath down, okay? So feel free to just find a posture that's alert. Here it's, it's a little bit important not to lean the back on anything. So if you're in a chair, it'd be good if you can sit towards the front of the chair. The reason is along our spine we have energy channels that run and when we sit on something we're compressing them so the wind energy gets stuck, it can't actually move through. So what I want you to do is simply place a hand on your belly. It can be your left or right hand, whatever feels comfortable. Just allowing the breath to enter the body through the nose really gently at your own pace, whatever speed you want and exit the body at the same place through the nose. I want you to just practice for a moment just breathing deep into the belly. So place your hand actually over your belly button to the lower belly. Just 
practice for a moment breathing deep into the belly and letting the belly expand so that the hand actually gets pushed out like you're filling a balloon with air. And then on the exhalation, at first you could just let your belly rest and then practice actually pulling the belly back towards the spine. So you're actually going to contract it back as you breathe out with the muscles of the abdomen. But in a really relaxed way, just letting the shoulders relax, letting the chest relax. So here as you do this, you may notice right away you're getting a little calmer, you're getting a little sleepier, so that's a good sign. <laughs> For some of us it takes a little longer. And so one thing that's happening here actually is uh, from a level, I'll talk about Western medicine now, which is uh, the vagus nerve gets triggered and soothed. We increase and tone our vagal nerve through deep belly breathing. So the vagal nerve is the wandering nerve moving all the way down into the gut. I think it's the longest nerve in the body. And the vagal nerve regulates a lot of processes in the body and especially helps us to regulate the nervous system, calming us, soothing anxiety. You also can tone the vagal nerve through smiling, which is a good thing. You can do it through gargling, singing and chanting. But deep belly breathing also works. Okay, so on the next inhalation, as you feel your belly expand, I'm going to ask you simply to hold your breath there. Gently, not pushing, but just holding the belly out like a balloon. Not for too long, breathe out. Then again, breathe in. And when your belly fills, just gently hold. Let the chest relax, let the shoulders relax. And you can gently press down with the transverse abdominals, the side abdominal muscles, just very gently. And again, breathe out. Breathe in. And just hold really gently. Okay, again, breathe out. And I'll just do this at your own pace for a few minutes. What you want to do is let the practice be really gentle. If you start to feel more tension when you're holding the breath, don't hold the breath. Just breathe in and out into the belly. And the hold should be long enough that you feel the energy beginning to settle, but also not too long. You want to be able to breathe out and breathe in again without having to gasp for air. So practitioners actually train in this. I have friends who can hold it here for several minutes. There's Tibetan practitioners who can hold it all day. So that goes into definitely the mystical territory of the body. So what I'm saying here is it can be trained. So we might only be able to hold it for five seconds at first, but eventually we'll be able to hold for longer. But that's not really the point here. The main point is as you feel the belly, as you fill the belly, it's allowing the excessive wind energy to go back home below the navel. Now that you have it in your body a little bit, 
I want you to practice breathing even lower. So now below the navel. It's not an easy place for most of us to breathe into. So it can take time. It actually took me six months to try to breathe down there. But it can help by putting some fingers just below the navel. And just feel what it feels like to breathe there and kind of push those fingers out with the belly as you expand. Then again, holding. And if you breathe actually well into the belly, you don't really need to push anything with the muscles. It simply just forms a type of vase or like a balloon. You just hold. Okay. So how did that go? You feel a difference? Yeah? A lot of people, it's pretty immediate. Like I said, you might get sleepy, you might feel like the head gets heavier, kind of like, you know, it's easier to relax. Eventually, if, if you have um, constriction in the chest, this will open up, or constriction behind, you know, in between the shoulder blades. Um, I recommend definitely, like, if you feel not unclear, feel free to reach out to me on this because it, it can be a little bit, um, I always give a little bit of a warning. If you get dizzy or you're feeling more tight, just stop the practice. Um, just go back to breathing without holding. Some of, uh, some of us are kind of like type A pushers in this kind of thing, and that will definitely create more agitation. So just be careful. That's why I'm really emphasizing gentleness, right? But if you do it, uh, I would say for 10 to 15 minutes a day, it will change your nervous system <laughs> for sure, right? Or I'm going to say rather it's going to change the wind energy that's affecting your nervous system, right? Based on the talk I gave. So I did this, I think, uh, like I said, I had uh, a lot of constriction in the heart and kind of a lot of anxiety. Uh, I, still, I still struggle with it, especially when I drink my double flat white espressos. <laughs> but um, it did really help me and I did it every day I think for a year or six months and it completely shifted me. So it's really interesting because a lot of what we might think is part of our personality will actually shift. That's what becomes quite interesting. You may not like it too at the beginning because you'll actually like, it, you may not feel as high, right? So you may have to get used to just feeling calmer. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people want calm, but they don't recognize then you also don't have that kind of neurotic excitement that we get attached to as a culture. But I would say you can still have a lot of joy. It's just not that neurotic excitement. So any last things before we kind of end tonight? Everybody good with the practice? Yeah, you feel comfortable with it? Back in towards your spine. That, I do that because it's just, it's helpful when, um, when kind of inhaling again. So it's sort of like it allows me to get all of the air out, right? So yeah, you can play with it. You don't have to, but I do it. Yeah. If it's kind of making you feel more tense in the practice, then don't do it. Just breathe out normally. Yeah. All right, well, thanks everyone.